welcome. Is anybody here for the first time? Yeah. Who are you guys? Oh, okay. What are you studying at Sac State? Nursing. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Nurse, nurses can do anything. <laughs> so um, today, <clears throat> I'd also like to welcome you know people that are here um, via uh, the Rainbow Bridge. <laughs> People in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Seattle, where else? Mm. Maybe somebody in um, Nevada, I don't know, right? So different parts of California. So I don't want to say remote because people are close. So I'm just saying kind of rainbow via the rainbow bridge, right? <laughs> <clears throat> so and I think the topic is, um, Patty asked me to say more about um, Shambhala journey. Is that the title? Okay. <clears throat> so generally, um, if you listen to yourself or listen to a Dharma teaching or reading a book, um, uh, it falls into uh, three or four categories. Sometimes we're reading or getting teachings from, you know, highest level. So we might be reading how how are things in Nirvana? What's it like when you're enlightened? Um, what what do um, teachers have to say about Ati Yoga, Mahamudra, and so forth? And then sometimes. Um, we're reading or we're listening to teachings, contemplating how things are like messed up. So we're getting clear about um, our reactive patterns and our craziness, the world's craziness, <clears throat> so forth. And then um, a big part of the teachings um, is about like the path, right? So sometimes we call it ground path and fruition. But um, there's also like a fourth way, like the whole thing, <laughs> doing it all. So you might say that's, um, you know, Dzogchen position, although I don't like saying position because it's not really position, but um, it's like totality, we have to do it all. So <clears throat> we have to practice from the standpoint of uh, liberation, practice from the standpoint of path, practice from the standpoint of um, uh, stuckness, and then practice from the standpoint of um, we're all doing it uh, all the time together. Because <clears throat> it's not really linear, is it? <laughs> I don't think so. So one of the big models in our tradition, Vajrayana Tantric tradition, is um, uh, the mandala. And uh, pictorially, the mandala is usually represented um, in, uh, uh, as a traditional Indian temple with, um, you know, four steps and four entrances and four gates and various, um, uh, you know, temples inside perhaps, but then having the Buddha or the uh, deity in the center. <clears throat> Maybe these temples were very popular during the rise of Tantra in India, you know, maybe around 8th, 9th, 10th centuries like that. So when we're talking about the state of totality from using the mandala, uh, we also notice that there's circles around. I'm, I'm facing the um, Kala Chakra mandala, but you guys aren't. <laughs> so it's right behind our, our nurse students there. <clears throat> so, um, uh, in a sense, we want to say being being the mandala, um, see it as the journey. But the important operational piece is that um, we uh, circumambulate the mandala 
and visit from all the perspectives finally um, coming into the center. So our Dharma practice really is, um, you know, finding uh, the balance at the center, the Maha Madhyamaka, the great middle way, the great completion, the, um, where we're able to see and manifest all uh, enlightened activity at the same time. How's that? Sound good? Why not? Right. So, um, but it is confusing for our students that we talk about steps and levels, right? So you think it's just kind of, I'm leaving the messed up nature and then I'm going up to the um, enlightened nature like that and I just kind of stay up there. <clears throat> so um, it is sometimes presented that way <laughs> because that's how people learn. They sometimes learn that way. But in, in our tradition, we uh, actually learn in a bunch of different ways. But um, primarily, we want to get you to um, this centralist center. So earlier at the 10 o'clock meditation, I talked about how it's necessary to develop balance. And we develop balance by um, uh, having the, the relative and the absolute world um, evenly um, placed. <clears throat> I sometimes hold my hands up like this. <laughs> I don't know, because I like to do this. But <laughs> as a kid, hi, hello, what do you think? <laughs> but um, we're really balancing like kind of clouds, right? So it's, it's not, uh, you know, like you're trying to match them up. But we are um, interested in uh, having a real clarity of the relative world, right? So the relative world, like my typical example is like streets, right? The line, let's say right and left. It's really a great, I like it example because the right and left shifts depending upon which direction you're going, right? <laughs> the absolute world is, we know that right and left are um, uh, something we've made up so that uh, we don't run into each other on the road and that right and left have no inherent existence. But um, just um, that's not enough, actually. So um, it's like sometimes we go, okay, I'm just going to get better or develop compassion or fix myself. And then other times, you know, so we want to change ourselves. And then other times we say, oh, no, I, I just have to learn to accept myself. Ever caught in that struggle? <laughs> it's like, okay, now I'm really going to change. Oh no, I'm done with change. I, I, that, that was wrong. Now, now I really got to work on self acceptance. <laughs> so um, from um, uh, completion yoga point of view, um, both of those are sides or biases, right? I, I totally accept. Like if you just go, okay, now I'm going to sit in meditation and let go. That, that still is a side, right? Still a side. So um, in uh, Great Completion Meditation, we, we want to um, balance those two uh, and see uh, the gap in the middle. Uh, some people are reading... Um, Mipam Rimshi's commentary on Shantarakshita's Madhyamaka Lankara, and um, translator translates um, Mipam Rimshi's saying, well, there's the proximate ultimate, and then there's the uncontrived state, right? So the uncontrived state, that's the middle. You, you, can't, you can't aim for it. <laughs> We try to do that, like, I'm going to aim for the middle. This is really important because I don't hear teachers talking like this very often, so I get upset, so I have to say it. So it makes it, the conventional reason with like, I'll just aim for the middle. Now, the only way you get the middle is by um, being unbiased towards both sides and allowing there to be a gap. You can't aim for the middle. Then, then, um, you know, one of my um, 
Sokchen teacher said that that's that's being a hunter. Sokchen hunter, you become you know aggressive towards your own mind. So we we have an unbiased view, which means we correctly see fully, uh, you know, both our clouds, so to speak, both sides. <clears throat> we see the street, so we see this uh, right and left. And we also see that um, the cars on the right have their right and the cars on the right have their right. <laughs> like that. And we realize that um, uh, they're empty from uh, and clear. So <clears throat> when we're doing more and more of our journey, uh, we're doing more balancing and both uh, sides, so to speak, uh, of the, um, you could say of the scale, they're both increasing, right? Your relative knowledge is getting um, greater as well as your absolute knowledge, right? We're not trying to leave behind the relative world. You still got to go to school, you know, like nurses need, we need nurses, right? Yeah. So uh, we are, we're increasing on both sides, but as our, our clouds <laughs> or little balls of cotton <laughs> or whatever, the light, it's light, you know, we can um, allow them to blossom and then there's more space between them, right? To, at first, in our journey, we have to kind of get them real kind of close to see them because usually we're just seeing one, we're putting it down, then we're just seeing another, putting it, we're doing this, right? So it does take a lot of work to like do this. And sometimes we just have to kind of hold them there. It's almost like you're doing this, you're vibrating so much because you're trying to see them both at the same time. It's difficult, don't you think? Because most people are always like, Okay, I want to see this side. Now I'm tired of this side. I'll see absolute side. Now I'm tired of absolute side. I'll just go and do the dishes. Now, now, now it's not about doing the dishes. It's about sitting in samadhi. You know, you know, it's not like that. <clears throat> but as uh, we both want to have them grow to their um, our karmic size, so to speak, then the space between them uh, become very broad and. Um, that's the uncontrived ultimate, we could say, from Zogchen's point of view, uncontrived view. But you can't say, now, now I'm doing, <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous, now, you know, now I'm doing the uncontrived view, right? <laughs> we, we could say, well, now I'm, um, the uncontrived view is, in a way, already there, isn't it? But we're giving, you know, but at the same time, we're also creating um, a little bigger space for it, don't you think? But we're not, we're not producing it. We're not hunting it. But uh, by having um, both uh, sides um, not fighting, then we can see this space better. It's hard to see space when you don't have any reference point whatsoever. Hmm. So the balance that, you know, I'm talking from kind of completions that like they're balanced, but they actually in our path, they don't go like that. They actually, it does kind of go like this. And <laughs> these steps are hard ones, you know, it goes like this, <laughs> it goes like that. So, um, it, you know, so in our actual path, the Shambhala journey, we um, we can't just kind of go, okay, balance. It, it, it goes like that, doesn't it? Yeah. A little bit like the Shark Cathedral um, uh, labyrinth. I have a little finger labyrinth. I don't know, has anybody been to Shark Cathedral? Yeah, did you, was, could you see the labyrinth? There were chairs over it, maybe. <laughs> so interesting. There, there's some labyrinths around Sacramento. <clears throat> maybe we could do a labyrinth walk someday here, wait, and when we have enough grassy space. <clears throat> goes like this, you know. <laughs> so that's maybe Western way of walking the mandala, right? 
I like the labyrinth because it looks like you go when you start, it looks like you're heading straight for the center and then it, it takes an abrupt turn to the left. And then it looks like you're getting almost close even then. And then as you go further, then you go out further. It looks like you're freaking lost, right? And then, so it takes a long time. But what happens when we're um, walking the mandala walking in the labyrinth is then we cover the whole territory. If you go straight for something, it's very linear. You don't cover the whole territory. You won't see the uh, uncontrived view because you're just narrowing it or choosing one side, correct? But in um, this journey um, of finding the balance, there, there are some predictable changes we go through. Um, so a number of years ago, I put together like a um, kind of graph or chart, somewhat based on um, Joseph Campbell's like uh, hero's journey. So <clears throat> we start out with uh, ordinary screwed upness, and then there's some kind of call from the outside or call from inside, and we decide to leave the ordinary world there are too many problems we're seeking to help someone or seeking to free ourselves or free others <clears throat> and there we we encounter obstacles and allies but um that's an important part of the journey and of uh, shambhala journey here is that at some point we have to cross a threshold so that's called threshold crossing or for um you budding Jungians, if you're out there, liminality. <laughs> that threshold crossing is generally um, kind of really unhinging and scary because um, we're leaving behind the familiar and um, going to um, the world of unknown, right? But that's an opportunity to um, see that openness or gap because in the threshold, we can kind of see both sides, right? So that's why I say, um, don't be on either side, be in the middle, the safest place. People going, I don't wanna be in the middle of that temple problem. I go, well, you're not ready for administration. <laughs> so in the, if we're in the middle of the strongest place actually. So if we're able to um, uh, stay enough time in that threshold or open experience, then, then we will start um, uh, journeying in the unknown world. <clears throat> and there, there are other different powers. Uh, so if we're saying we're starting out at zero, then we go to like, uh, I don't know, 90 degrees or something? Or is it 45? I don't know math. Go, if you go a quarter, that would be 45 degrees maybe. <clears throat> at the 90 degrees at the top that's like a union experience it's still in the um unknown world right sometimes um people describe union experiences um uh like uh they're there but in our tradition union experience means that you're not there <laughs> <laughs> so if we say uh, I'm feeling one with all of nature um, then that's not a union experience um, it's like union experiences like we disappeared for a moment and then we reappeared a little bit differently but when you disappear you disappear that maybe is difference between Buddhist idea and some other traditions. The other traditions is the self is always there. Buddhist idea is like, no, we can just disappear. But guess what? Because things are dynamic, you'll reappear, but a little bit different. So that union, sometimes called divine marriage or um, samadhi, or in some traditions, enlightenment for us, that's just halfway, right? It's just, you know, 
maybe that's 180, I don't know. But in any case, then we have to leave that world because that's not, com uh, that's not the end. And the journey, the journey kind of back down the other side of the wheel or the mandala, I generally with Joseph Campbell is bringing back the goodness, bringing back things to help people. But in our tradition, um, that um, becomes uh, the, the threshold. You know, we have to cross back. We've been in the unknown, non-personal world, and we have to cross back, re-enter the personal world again, like astronauts. I don't know, I'm really old. I remember John Glenn, you know, coming back. And, Is it going to burn up, right? <laughs> so like you're watching Walter Cronkite, like it's going to burn up. So when we leave the uh, transpersonal unknown world and come back to the personal world in a deep way, it's a real crucifixion. We don't like it. It burns. Yeah. We think it's like you get enlightened and then everything gets great or you have a oneness experience and then everything is great. No, you can't stay in the oneness experience. It's just temporary from Buddhist point of view. And then you're coming back and uh, you're, and that's when you go trial by fire, right? Mm. You know, and the wisdom deities have fire around them like that, right? <clears throat> so you do come back and you help others and establish um, temples or help people or become a nurse or teacher or partner or whatever, have kids and do it. Um, but from our point of view, as um, highest yoga practitioners, um, that's not over. Usually we have to go through, as I mentioned a few months ago, then we have to go through a period of being misunderstood, betrayed and exiled. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so that's very painful. Um, that's a, a real stripping away. It feels like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I went through all that. I, I did all that. I, I went through all these trials and I don't know, what just shit I had to go through and the, all these experiences. And, and now you're giving me shit, you know, it's like that. So it's like, maybe you've been married 20 years and you think, okay, we're done. It's just going to coast. <laughs> Think, oh, well, that's that's over. Like, okay. Or you think now I'm 40, 45, you know, uh, and I'm at the peak of my powers or something or whatever, I made it, you know. But then those of us are on the other side of 40 or the other side of 50 or the other side of 60, know that then it, it, our body starts betraying ourselves a little bit, right? We've done all the right things, you know, right? We're getting massages going to Arden Hills, you know, so. <laughs> but um, if we stay with the process, then um, eventually uh, we come back to the, the, true, uh, the true uncontrived state. You know, if we don't, you know, buy into like uh, the, the nihilistic side or the eternalistic side, if we don't like totally buy into um, or get discouraged, maybe best way by the misunderstandings, betrayal. Then, then we're just back to like the grass is green and the sky is blue. We're back to just being an ordinary person. So, it's not the ordinary person quite who left. Dorothy was a little bit different when she got back to Kansas, right? <laughs> but it's just okay. Um, did you pick up the mail, you know, before you came home? You know, I mean, it's just that world, but it, it's it's a totally um, ordinary, but um, maybe we could call it trans-ordinary world, right? You just so appreciate it. <clears throat> uh, so uh, that journey um, could, you know, is reenacted in our lifetime from birth until death, right? But uh, so those who go through the whole cycle sometimes um, reach ordinary mind at the time of death or in the bardo where 
it's um, maybe already happened, but uh, or rainbow body, as I've talked before. So I mentioned that because from the standpoint of highest yoga, like rainbow body is just ordinary. That's important. Have you heard these teachings before? No, you haven't. You know, people always say rainbow body is extraordinary, right? As you think, I want that. No, just you have to just be ordinary. <laughs> and then it's just ordinary. Rainbows are ordinary, right? Like just regular rains and we get rainbows. I mean they're nifty, don't you think? Or like your kid and you're doing the garden hose in the sun and wasting all the water <laughs> your mom's going put that down you know but you're just watching the, the rainbow from the hoses isn't that neat yeah it's that childlike ordinary mind right not thinking oh i'm special i've got rainbow body no it's just oh this is really this is cool like that but still ordinary don't you think you're just in your backyard it's just in your backyard with the hose making making rainbows, blowing bubbles, it's like that. <clears throat> so um, maybe I should stop babbling here and have it to um, end, but uh, people have some comments or questions or complaints, we can take them. <clears throat> you must use the microphone, that's our only requirement. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Lama. Um, you had mentioned at the outset that sometimes um, the path is differentiated between ground path and fruition. I yeah. was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Well, they said usually um, there's three or four. Like usually we're either talking from the completion state or talking from the path state or we're talking about from samsaric state how screwed up things are. You know, if you look at sermons or if you look at books, or you look at your own, you're usually thinking in those three ways. And then, but it's also possible to think from a totality point of view. Like we have to experience and traverse all those regions, right? So in the Shambhala guidebooks, um, the different um, uh, experiences are metaphored as um, or analogy, I don't know, but you know, it's like swamps and ices and mountains and rivers and oceans and things like that that correspond to the different um, transformational experiences we have to go through. The main ones being leaving ordinary reality, going through a, um, you know, a liminal state, and and then achieving some kind of union and then having to give up that union go going coming back and and uh you know crossing over again and then having finally to like um uh have to re-establish a sense of ordinary world in, in a totally new way so it's like that <laughs> right now so Yeah, good question. Makes sense, doesn't make sense. It's too abstract right now, you know, but we need some structure. We have to say something once in a while. <clears throat> well, sometimes, it, you know, sometimes it's best, you know, we just say, well, keep going and you'll find out. <laughs> Hi, thank you. For hi. Talk. Yeah, hi. Um, you talked about the threshold. Yeah, threshold too. Can you talk about the threshold more? I got lost. I tripped. <laughs> yeah, well, that's how you get to the threshold, you see. Yeah, so, you know, you know, Alice fell down the rabbit hole. That That's a threshold experience, right? Where, um, 
suddenly our, our sense of the world and the sense of identity is is profoundly shifted and of course usually we just try to get back to our ordinary old self right but somehow maybe because of good karma or training or just who we are we're 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 kind of going through the threshold in into a more an unknown world but usually when there's major disruptions in our life and our world or an identity are really shifted, we try to scramble back like squirrels going back to the other side. So a threshold experience um, could be, and lots of times is kind of a, a divine accident, so to speak, where um, we've created somehow some cause and conditions so that in a um, kind of a healthy way, our limited sense of self breaks down or um, like that. Um, and of course, you know, in a way, if we sign up for real Dharma practice, you know, we're, we're going to get some nudges toward threshold experiences, right? And that's already happened, correct? So, but generally, I would say when I go through threshold experiences, um, I'm bitching up the mountain. I'm bitching up the mountain. You know, I'm not saying this is great. <laughs> Um, so that's that's ordinary kind of church spiritual practice, like you know, all, you can just bypass the crucifixion and and just go with the resurrection or something like that. But um, you know, threshold experiences can be positive, but generally every time our sense of identity shifts or grows, it's unsettling, like that. Um, and generally after a oneness experience or the kind of experience where we, we think we've achieved paradise or some stability in our practice, um, you know, the, the path or the turn of the wheel kicks us back into a disintegrating threshold. And usually that's seen as some kind of betrayal, you know, or we've achieved a lot in our lives or whatever, you know, we think we have in a healthy way. And then friends die or a body falls apart or people didn't turn out to be so great and you know things like that but then if we stay with that um experience we go through that threshold and then go back to um the ordinary world of um uh losing it then um well you know then we come to what in the heart sutras you know it's like um no attainment, but also no non-attainment. That's that place. Otherwise known as Prajnaparamita, like that, totally. But it's hard just to be ordinary. <laughs> we always want to be really nifty ordinary. <laughs> you know, kind of ordinary in a cool way. Yeah. So that's, but th these liminal or threshold experiences um, can be very dramatic, and that, that makes, of course, good biographies and movies and things, but sometimes they're very gradual, and um, it doesn't look like anything's quite happening, and that can be confusing too, which is, um, you know, they're happening kind of unconsciously, <laughs> to use psych terms, like they're happening a little bit off stage, but they're really happening, and that's that's generally why we need teachers and therapists and mentors and guides because um, the obvious threshold experiences are kind of obvious, but um, you know the ones that are happening a little bit off stage and maybe subtler. You know, generally we need to have those pointed out. And lots of times those are the most profound, of course. You know, like that. Oh, good question. La, la, la. Is this working? Yeah, it's working. Uh, thank you for the talk. I um, actually wish I'd heard that teaching, you know, many years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <It's> ex <laughs> definitely explains some yeah. situations coming coming back to reality. Definitely yeah. had that. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, um, how do you support, you know, loved ones or yourself through that? that part I, like I'm hearing that my daughter is turning nine and at nine they have sort of that 
out of the childhood realm into the sense of mm. self and that can be very difficult like how do you support people through that right <laughs> how how good so um we i try to you know talk about a balance of challenge and support so real support can't be 100 percent support or people will just be like lying on the couch too much challenge and people will disintegrate so it's it's that balance of challenge and support so sometimes you use the example of when i worked as a camp counselor and kids had to like dive so i i would get them up on the diving board that part they had to do but i don't push them off the diving board but i will push people you know get on the diving board so if someone stays with me and they go well i'd like to study with you but i don't want to get on the diving board i just want to slip into the pool then you're meant for another teacher right but i'm not going to push you off the diving board because if the teacher pushes you off the diving board you don't feel the bounce you just fall off the diving board <laughs> i don't know does that ever happen to you <laughs> it's like by mistake you trap and then you fall off the diving board that's not fun right you don't want to be pushed off the diving board you want to you want in vajrayana particularly you want to feel the bounce but many people just want to sit and have their feet in the water and they won't ever feel the they'll never have a threshold experience that way right so um we do we do want to get them up on the diving board it's okay to get them up there and then they kind of go I can't do it. I can't do it. And we go, okay, not just experience not doing it. Maybe bounce for a second and come on down. You see, so that that could be a lot. Like tomorrow, let's get up there. So I, obviously, I follow kind of systematic desensitization <laughs> anxiety programs. You know, get you know get you know like let's stay on the diving board five minutes next time. Bounce a few more times. Talk about the water, and then come down. Because um, in many religious traditions and Dharma teachers that I've run into, not the ones I like to study with, but they don't give you, they, you there's no bounce. They're just kind of like, you know, I don't know, you just kind of slide into the water. And that's okay, that's the style, right? But in, in our um, Dzogchen style, um, you, you, you want that like that you want a little bit of the pop right you want the expressions that's why we have friday expressions because dharma's all, from our point of view it's all about that express express something show me it's a show me world where a lot of people go i i want to be enlightened and i want to help others but i don't want anybody to see me and if i make a mistake i don't want others to see it then you want another tradition right you want the hideout tradition. <laughs> then you know like that so you know, a, a kind of persistent support to get someone to feel the jump. So we say in the Mah in, um, Tilopas Mahamudra, the dharmas of the leap. So, but some people, you know, you can't push people to the leap, otherwise they won't feel the leap. They'll just feel like they've fallen. But they'll accuse you of being pushing. You'll, the kids will accuse us. You, know, you push me over. I've, you know, and, and I go, no, you fell over, or that was a jump you didn't like. Does that make sense? Because yeah, they will always get you, know, you push me, and then the other time, then the other kind of kid or student will go, you're supposed to push me. I paid you a lot of money. You're supposed to push me <laughs> over. So I'll I'll get you up to the trough, but you're you know, Susan grew up with horses, and so do I. You know, we can we it, that maximum you can lead a horse to water, right? Yeah, if they're not thirsty, they're not going to drink anything, right? But you can say, okay, it's really weird. You can ride, and sometimes um, horse people, and you think, God, they, they must be worn out, and they want to drink, and then they don't. Why is that? Anybody know why? We see people out there. Maybe because we're watching them, you know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but we don't. We don't do that. We don't jam somebody's face into the food. 
but because we don't do that, people will say, you're supposed to jam my face in the food or you're supposed to push me your, to the dive and uh, I'll pay you a lot of money. You know, Trung Perm, she had a wonderful poem in one of his books on that I heard him read one time, like all this kind of begging, like, if you just allow me to do this or if you'll do this for me, I'll pay you a lot of money and I'll promise I'll be your student forever or I'll do this, you know, just, just, just push me over, do the work for me, in other words, right? Kids will do that too. Like, you're supposed to do this, and you'll know you, you got to learn this, how to do this, Kaya. You know, you could do that, right? You know, it's just every day, it's just new. So you can't snow, right? You can't go. It's, you know, I see all the time. I see all the time. We covered that. But then I get that from Robert Nakashima too. Tai Chi teacher goes, we covered that. <laughs> well, well, we did it, you know, but that, <laughs> I, mean, I didn't learn it. You, you didn't, so, you, you know, then, then you didn't practice it. And I go, well, I didn't practice it enough. I, I did a little bit. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm on both sides, right? I know what it's like to be kind of pushed and then, but you just can't manifest. Somebody can't make you have that expression moment that pop right they can't do it for you so that's why we're, we're not a religion you know you know the buddha didn't do it for us it's not a salvation religion nobody can can do that leap for you yeah. well we can support others i don't know long long answer <laughs> funny yeah <clears throat> Thanks a lot. Yeah. I, I've been uh, listening to your talk, thinking of it in the context of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, kind of feels like a neutron bomb. Mm -hmm. um, like all this kind of devastation and, and just dramatic change um, in terms of the shifting of identities for people, for example. Um, um, not you know, can we go back to the way things were before? Mm -hmm. And um, when you know, some people, when they go back, it's with newfound appreciation. You know, thinking about that hero's journey, like, mm -hmm. uh, or just seeing things, um, just being with people again, for example, and mm -hmm. just sincerely appreciating that, whereas before it was taken for granted. Right. Um, and just the great resignation and how people just was I living the life I really wanted to be living and just so so much reflection and um you know I know for me it kind of kicked me out to the outside of the labyrinth mm -hmm. um I wasn't going on retreats and you know all these things that were part of my practice just were taken from me coming to the temple and being with sangha and so I'm just wondering I don't know for our, ourselves and, and also as, as bodhisattvas, you know, is there some way that you see that we bring this, this opportunity, this crisis equals opportunity, like how do we use this mass global um, wobble uh -huh. to help people to understand, um, be more mindful of this journey and, and how they can bring that mindfulness to the experience instead of walking along unconsciously. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, there's, uh, there's active uh, compassion, you know, we, we all should be at least doing, you know, trying to do something right. You know, even if it's just picking up some trash, right, you know, doing something. And then we have to do a lot on the inner world too. So we should be doing both at once. But um, generally, um, when we read uh, the Namtara, the um, enlightenment stories, liberation stories, Tom, Tara means like liberation, the liberation stories of the great teachers, um, they did a whole bunch of training. 
So, um, you know, like reading through, you know, particularly um, uh, like Yeshia Sogyal's um, biography, Terma text, and also um, um, Mandarava's biography, which I hadn't met, got through the whole time last time, and now I did uh, just this morning. So it's translated, um, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So the immense amount of practice, the immense amount of hardships the lineage teachers have gone through. So we can have these discussions, you know, so um, really, you know, we always have to be saying, um, you know, do a little bit more. <laughs> So you you always want to be a little bit tip. I mean, balance doesn't mean this. Balances were actually like this because we're we're kind of going this way. So always a, we, you know it's not this. It's actually we're a little bit for you know uh, Zogchen style. It's a little bit you know like uh, ah yeah not. Nah not inside like oh yeah what like that so we're doing we're doing more you know and, and when we say balance from vajana point of view we generally mean you know leap or doing doing or expression or doing more not just kind of like that's enough <laughs> You know, that's kind of, that's, that's our criticism of our heart, right? From my other point of view, like, I'm good. I've been doing some self-acceptance and self-compassion training and I'm good. I mean, of course we want to do that. We do want to feel like I'm good, but we, we also want to, you know, extend ourselves in this kind of balanced way that we feel like we're a little bit uh, leaping. So more from a little, do a little bit more on the outside. So that's why I like chaplaincy training. You know, just you know, do some kind of mitzvah or something, you know, like let's do something. Good question. So maybe one more, one more complaint. Huh? Yeah, the the Rainbow Bridge people are remarkably, they're very strong in their training and practice, so they don't have to ask a lot of questions, you know, they're very... <laughs> okay, Jack, they're waving from Kingston. Hi, Lama. Washington. <laughs> um, I, I was wondering, you know, how how do you know if you're kind of just sticking back on the the diving board um is there just a feeling of not putting yourself out there yeah it's, it's very hard you know like the, the 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 proper kind of expression or you know the a real dive feels fantastic right you know real expression uh the real um uncontrived ultimate, you know, where um, you're just in space um, uh, is supportive in a different way than um, having a substratum, right? So, uh, um, you know, Trang Paramshe used to talk about, you know, not, not trying to go back to the reference point. You know, if you're always constant, you know, you know, when I was studying Zen with the Korean teacher, San Sanim, it, it always catch you, check, no checking. We're constantly checking ourselves. It's different than being mindfulness. Constant checking and measuring and evaluating. But, you know, actually we just need a lot of people to, you know, point it out. <laughs> There's no, you know, that's the problem. We need other people, you know, we're, it, it's difficult to kind of know, are we being complacent or are we being settled? Are we really kind of in a leap, uh, an organ, you know, a real wonderful leap expression or are we just kind of babbling? 
know, but generally if we're trying to hold on to some territory, you know, uh, and not look stupid, then we're probably a little too complacent. Most people don't want to look stupid at our age, right? They want to look, you have it together. Right? We don't want to take any, you know, we always want, I think it's the hardest, like we say, eight worldly dharmas, right? We usually want pleasure, not pain. We usually want gain, not loss. We usually want praise, not blame. We usually want recognition, not ignoring. But, um, you know, I, I want to stay in the leap. Like, is, is okay if nobody knows what I'm doing? So, would that be okay? Let's say you just did a whole bunch of good things. <clears throat> which a friend of mine used to call Bodhi Mitzvahs, for those who know a little Yiddish, you know, like, no one knew what you were doing. You didn't take any credit. In fact, people criticized you, like, I don't think you're doing much, but you're just doing it all at night, or, you know, you're helping the elves, and would that be okay? You know, you're just making the world a better place, and no awards, you know, people think you're just kind of, a, you know, not doing much. Would that be okay? It's not okay, huh? Yeah, Shanti Deva, totally Shanti Deva. Like, you know, so that's why you know, um, I like to be reminded of, um, uh, you know, somebody asked uh, Robert Aiken Roshi, but um, how would you like to be remembered? Or he would say, you know, my, I would be really happy if you forget me. <laughs> nice. Okay, that's good. Good questions. Any last burning desires, as we'd say in 12 step? <laughs> Nurses, what do you think? So there's already lots of literature. I don't know if you're doing the must for a class, you know, the benefits of meditation, lower blood pressure, reduce cholesterol, be less annoying, you know, so um, <laughs> you can do that. But the, usually all the apps and contemporary mindfulness things don't talk much about um, transformation and journey, right? It's, you're staying pretty much your ordinary person who you think you are, just being a little bit more mindful, a little better person, which I'm totally all about, right? I mean, that's great. I'm not, you know, I, I do want people to drive on the right hand side of the road and just be kind of nice. That, that's a huge right there, right? This, you know, so, but um, the tradition we do is, this is kind of a hot tradition. It's a transformational kind of path also, but, um, you go through, you're already going through a lot as a nurse, so it's very transformational, I would imagine. Yeah, it can't be the same as when you first talk to the nurse recruiter. <laughs> so like that. Yeah, okay, perfect. So should we close? dedication due to the, the merits, merits of these, these virtuous, virtuous actions may, may i quickly attain the state of a guru buddha, buddha and lead all living beings without, without exception into that enlightened state, state. May, may the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow and may, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more in the land encircled by snow mountains you are the source of all happiness and good all-powerful all powerful, Chen Rezi, Tenzin Gyatso, please, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. 
Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Dragpa, I make the request at your holy feet. say and then they could add to it maybe so um okay that's my apologies oh. <laughs> okay so i i'll keep that in mind and try to be short <laughs> so uh uh elizabeth is uh, referring to that we have a a team from lions roar that's going to participate and the run to feed the hungry on thanksgiving morning and elizabeth's over here and she'd be uh, maybe want to add to what I've just said, but that's one announcement. And then another one, we have a free book, a free book giveaway. And so, and you're welcome to uh, kind of look at our books that are there so far. There'll be more coming, and that's lasting until November 13th. And then um, we have a, and then this last one, we have a movie on November 12th that's called uh, Gratitude Revealed, and it's such a beautiful movie. I've seen the preview, and um, that'll be here. On November 13th. All these things are in the ROAR, which is a newsletter. If you want to receive, you can uh, put your email um, it's in the entryway. So, excuse me. Oh, and then um, we have some salads and just really delicious food to share with you. We get to know each other a little better. So thank you so much for coming. And if you're able to help us out to help others, we have a donation box in the back. <laughs> Um, excuse me. Oh, oh Geshla uh, was having a class, but Geshla is trying to become an American citizen. He's our Mongolian monk, and so he doesn't have time to do the class right now because he's studying really hard. So we uh, that will be in the future. So thank you so much. Have I covered everything? Yeah. Yeah. Very good.